Uh, I begin with a mixed announcement of sadness and joy. Um, Otis all passed. Was it Wednesday? I think Tuesday or Wednesday. I'm not sure. Um, he just never snapped back out of that last thing he was going through, and it's it's 89. You know, the Bible teaches us in Psalm 91 that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High God, it closes that psalm out by saying he shall be satisfied with long life. We went out to Otis's house a couple of months ago, and he was demonstrating his satisfaction with his life. He was reminiscing about everything he had done over the years, and just a sweet man. As we've got over the last week, we've got to meet the family, and they're all just precious as Otis is. And the service will be today at 2 o'clock, visitation from 1 to 2, and services at 2 o'clock at Bikes Funeral Home in Sylvester. So when it's over here, I got to boogie woogie, get on over there. Um, but y'all just lift up the family. They're a very close family. I think people are coming in from Oklahoma and California and just all over. Um, and he, 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 his wife passed, I think, in 03. Is that right? I think so. You know, he never talked about it to us, but she was the love of his life. He couldn't talk about her is what the situation was. And um, she used to be a cowboy. Yeah, he was a cowboy in real life. A real cowboy. A real life cowboy. Um, he was the chief engineer at WALB for 14 years also. Ha! Ah, he was a good man, going to be missed. I, he, there were times when I didn't know what to do, and the only encouragement I was getting at church was from Otis. For a good while there, every Sunday after the service, he would assure me I was on the right track, and he would do it with tears. Sweet man, he said, he said, all my life I've thought that God was mad at me, that he was just waiting to jump on me when I mess up. He said, but to find out. And he, every time he would tell me that, he would start crying. Sweet man, we're going to miss him. Already am missing him. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for um, Susie's birthday wishes. It was last Thursday. Thursday, right? And everybody just went overboard. God bless each and every one of you. We were astounded with all the, the get, uh, get well, all of the sweet wishes of happiness and, <laughs> and comfort and peace. <laughs> and it was glorious. I think Neil Glory's birthday was also Thursday, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yep. We have the same birthday. Yep, have the same. Where's she at? Savannah. Savannah. Well, bless your heart for coming to church. I didn't go to Savannah with her. They didn't want me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me. I don't know if y'all saw my Facebook page yesterday, but Jeff Turner back, I don't remember when it was, 2014, 15, something like that. We had a... a what would you call it, a conference over at, when we were at Stewart. And I was having such a hard time communicating what I believe God was leading us into. And so I had to get some experts here. Y'all know what an expert is? Absolutely. Somebody from out of town. So we, we had uh, Caleb Miller from Colorado and um, Michael Harden, a great theologian. I don't know where he's from, Michigan, I think. No, Illinois, is that where he is? And Jeff Turner from, from Detroit, around that area. Jeff Turner was a, an associate pastor at Brownsville Assembly of God in Pensacola when all of that revival was going on. See, he's seen everything from every side. But he did a, I found out when I saw what he had posted on, on his page yesterday, he, the, the exploration of penal substitutionary atonement and eternal conscious torment that he did. That was the first night he had done that. He did it that night. And that's, I put it on my page, if you want to go back and see it. It was very good. It was very moving. It was one of those boom things for a lot of people 
where you suddenly go along with you got your, your, your beliefs all in a row and you don't want them to change and suddenly they change. That's what happened to me. And one of our people, Ashley Kinnett, put there yesterday, he, he said, I was there that night. It blew all my religious constructs to pieces, changed every outlook I have, not just on religion, but made me question absolutely everything I thought I knew. Couldn't go back if I wanted. Thank you, Stan, for opening the door. And I think that some people did get something out of it. I really had high hopes for that. And I don't think we had over 150 people there on any night. And I just, I just, there's not enough askers and seekers and knockers, you know, but they're, they're happening now though, I'm telling you. People are beginning to see things are going on. What I'm going to talk about today, I think I have a little something for everybody. Um, it's nothing new, I don't think. Maybe there is one pretty important thing that I'm seeing now that might, we might, we might need to harp on for a little while. But we're going to be talking about the choices we make, Deuteronomy 30. God says, I put before you life and death, blessings and curses, therefore choose life. He tells you what's before us, life and, and, and life and blessings and death and curses. Therefore, and it's up to us. Sounds like he may, it must be up to us. Not what we can ask him to put in our path, but it's what we by our decisions cause to happen in our life. He says, therefore choose life that you and your seed, you and your children and your grandchildren, shall be blessed. And that's, that's an important thing. We're going to be talking about that today. Um, in this awakening that is going on, there are a lot of suddenlies happening. Are you having any things, you'll be thinking things one way and suddenly within 24 hours you've changed or done a 180. That happened to me with two great deceptions that has been going on in the world and in the church. And it happened to me like at the same time and it just staggered me. But I believe we're in for a lot more booms in the next month. I think July is going to be a very interesting month. And I think we're going to see some things come to pass that I've been believing were going to happen for the last four years. And a lot of people like me. Um, you know, here's where I am with everything and the uncertainty of it. And I read things. I don't know if some things are true, some things are not. Um, but we've been hearing lately a lot of things about Russian naval vehicles. Have y'all heard those vehicles? Uh, submarines and, sh and ships and aircraft carriers around us near here. And Tommy asked me the other night, he said, does that cause any fear to rise up in you? Does that cause you to be scared? And not in the least. I don't give it a second thought. I know that there's a coalition of good from God going on in the earth realm right now. And the end's going to be good. I, they, it could be going on in order to cause fear. The enemy operates by fear. God operates by faith. The enemy operates by fear because they the same thing. Just the opposite ends. Um, I think we're about to realize a lot of what we've been taught about, we've been taught throughout our lives is not the way it really is. I think we're going to find out that a lot of things in science that were wrong on purpose. We were told intentionally not the truth about it. Same thing we're finding out right now about medicine. Goodness, it's falling so fast about the medical field and what's going on and some of the very things they have been prescribing for us to take care of things are actually causing the things that they're wanting to do away with. Do a little bit of research on this. This is happening everywhere. And they're beginning to admit these things. That's, that's a good thing when they're beginning to fess up to what's going on. Um, and I, I'm beginning to find out that history is really almost in some areas a complete fantasy. Goodness, if, if they can get us believing a certain way, they've got us, you know. The spiritual things that we have been taught by the New Testament church, and not at the fault of any of the pastors, all they're doing is repeating what they have been taught. But I'm talking about the infiltration of the church began while Je just after Jesus was ascended to the Father, probably before then. Um, the, the infiltration was there, and we're going to talk about a little bit of that in the book of Genesis today. But um, I think they've been intentionally wrong to get us going down the wrong path. Our realm was infiltrated in the garden with Adam and Eve, and it was done by lies, making them to believe something that was false, believing something that was wrong was right. And I mean, she really thought she was doing the right thing even when she talked 
Adam into doing it. She thought she, it was the same thing. If Jesus had been there, he would have said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Because that's all of our problems every day. Amen? Amen. If God is supposed to be our refuge, and he is mine, and our secret place, our hiding place, he's supposed to be our, 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 our teacher and our strength, you can, if, if he is those things in your life, and you can take him at those positions over your circumstances, then you'll be able to sidestep every snare. I, I say every snare. I'll say most of the snares that the enemy has in your path ready to grab you as you walk by. But you can, he said, I put before you life and blessings and death and curses, therefore choose life. When you choose to be a disciple, and I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about where your quest is to know God and go and know him better and to be an example of God to the people that you know and that you, you have influence over. When that happens, then you can bet you'll be able to miss the curse. You'll be able to sidestep all of the evil plans that are against you. We don't look toward big bad things coming our way. And when they do show up, when we let something slip and they do show up in our lives, we all it takes is just changing your mind, getting back to, oh Lord, I see where I messed up. And suddenly it's made right. God makes right that which the devil tried to tear up. Y'all see that in your life? Life is set up in such a way that the choices that we make, just like in the garden, decide either our success or our failure. And I'd much rather be successful in what I do than fail. I failed for 30 years. I literally did. And in my adult years, from the time that I was a, 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 in my late teens up to the age of 30, every choice I made was down the wrong path. The first right one I did was help. That was the right decision that I made, and it's still paying off to this day. But our decisions follow, um, um, this decide our future, and not in just the things about God, but in everything that has anything to do with your day-to-day -day living. Our success, so does your failure. It has to do with your decisions. Not necessarily our education or lack of education, praise God. Not because of our abilities or not abilities or our talents or any of those things. The main catalyst is the decisions that we make, whether it be good or bad decisions, the right or wrong, the one that we hear deep inside of us that we know we should do on the other side of it. I knew better than to. We say that too many times. The less times you say that in your life, the better your life will be producing fruit. Right. Amen. 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 I told you that when I back up and I look at from a objective approach to everything that I've been through the last four decades and then some, what I'm doing, I'm trying to figure out life. I'm trying to figure out God. And it's, it's not something that I will arrive at one day and say, got it. That's never going to happen. It's not going to happen this side of heaven. When we see him, we'll be like him. But up until then, it's always going to be a quest. It's always going to be a, a desire. And I hope y'all are doing the same thing. That's who I hope I'm talking to this morning. The ones who are genuinely wanting God to be the captain of this ship. And he will be if you will just allow him to. You know, a lot of people in the earth realm, I'm talking a lot, didn't listen to Paul when he said, be not conformed to the world. They have just surrendered. They just gave up. And instead of surrendering to God, they did exactly what the enemy wanted them to do. And they began to get their directive from the people they're around. And the people they're around got their directive from the people they're around. It, it's like we wake up one day and find out our group, however big it can be, it can be a real large group or a small little group that gets together at the VFW on Friday night, whatever it is, you're gonna, under, you're gonna see, wake up and see one day, well, you know, we all got the same hairdo. We all dress the same. We all drive the same, same cars. Ain't a Chevrolet in the bunch. But you begin to see those things. And where are we getting the information to make our decisions? 
A lot of times it's not information to make the decisions. All we're doing is conforming to that that is, a, a, that is around us. There's a guy named, so he was a psychologist, si Solomon A-S-C-H, Ash. And it was in the 60s, I think. I've heard it was in the 70s, but I believe it goes back to the 60s. And I'm going to just sort of make up the things he did. He did a lot of these things. He was doing tests, uh, trying to figure out life, trying to figure out people. And he would take like 17 people that were paid actors. And they would be in a room, and there would be like a petition between each one of them as they sat around a table. And then there would be the, the people that were at random picked off the street that they were, that was the study group. They were going to try, try to find out what they would do when the other group did something together. And what they did with them, one of the tests they did, they would show them a picture of a triangle. And one of them would look at it, and he was, he was told to do this. Now, he's a paid actor. He's, he's told to say these things. He would look at the triangle, and he would say, oh, well, that's, that's a square. And then they would pass it to the next one, and every one of them would look at it. Those 17, everyone would look at it and say, well, that, that's a square, when it was full well a triangle. And then when it got to the ones that were the test was all about, they didn't suspect that there were any actors in the room, but everybody was like him, they would say, yeah, it's, it's a square. And they found out something. Every once in a while, if one of them would say, no, that, that's, that's a triangle, then the ones that overheard that, that were of the, of the test group, they would go along. It went down to 5% that would still say it was a square, and the rest of them would agree that it was a triangle. So if one person can stand up in the face of the lies that are going on, just one, you can get down the people that are following just because they don't know any other thing to do. You can get that to change in them. That is what has been going on with the mainstream media from at least the 50s and probably way before that. The thoughts that we get and the, to make the decisions that we make come without a doubt from the mainstream media, from Hollywood, from television, from music, from the things that are controlled by you. Know, Check out who controls these things. They are not the good guys. I'm not talking about the musicians or the actors. Now, they get caught up in it. A lot of them get in a lot of trouble. They get um, compromised and they get set up. A lot of them do. But this is evil being introduced in our realm through those things that we allow our eyes and our ears to participate in. Amen. I know that... Um, I heard Candace Owens was the first one that I heard talking about Solomon Ash in his test, and I went and looking it up other places. And she lately has been, I don't know if you're a follower of hers, I, I really love her, but she had, but remember back when I said it's like the hand has been removed from my mouth and now I can say things that I've been holding back on? Not everything I want to say. That's where she is. She is selling all of these things that great study has been, been on, but it points out all of the deceitfulness that we have been told in all of those areas that I mentioned a little while ago. And she's, and she's really good at it. God is right now ending something. You've heard me say it a million times. And at the same time, something else is starting up. And it's being revealed that at least since the 50s, we've been hooked up to all of these artificial conformity things that we're supposed to be moving towards and just because we hear it and we don't want to be the one that stands out. I brought up last week my start. What does it mean? What business is it of the world whether or not I have popcorn on my ceilings? Why is it suddenly this is out? And you got to pay $4,000 to take it down. Why? Because you don't want somebody to come over and look up and say, well, well ain't you something? You still got popcorn on your ceiling. Don't you know that that's not in style anymore? That's the way we are, isn't it? We're afraid to be ourselves. And until you can boldly be yourself, you're not going to carry out the plan that God has for your life to the full degree that he wants to see it carry out in your life. 
I try not to do that. And I, I, it's on purpose, a lot of it is, but I try not to copy anything. We did a little bit of copying back. We were Stuart trying to get into the hip stuff that the church was doing, and TC got into it a good bit. And I just could not bite into it. I, just, I still have to do what I believe God is showing me. That's the only agreement I had with him. And I said, Lord, anything I believe you're showing me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it with the people, you know? <clears throat> but they've been telling us, they've been instructing us and planning everything in our realm, telling us what to wear, what to think, how to act, who to vote for, who to hate, who is good, who is bad. And I came to the conclusion, and I told you all this, if the mainstream media is telling me to do something that is good for me, I on purpose do the exact opposite. Because they are not here for my benefit. They are at the, at their, got strings attached to every single one of them, some way or another. I know, um, I think Samuel, Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain said, if voting really changed things, they wouldn't let us do it. And he said that a long time ago. And I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I, I don't like hurting people's feelings. And that, that's something that I understand personally. Um, but living like sheep, doing what others are doing, copying what other people are doing is not living. It is not Zoe, the life that Jesus came to give us. If you're living a life apart from trusting our Creator, you are not living life to the degree that God has planned for you to. Amen? Amen. And I really, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings this morning, but living like a zombie is not Zoe. It, it's not what Jesus came for we can enjoy. He came that we might have life and have it abundantly. And you know, when I say these things, when I talk about, I know a lot of people love the mainstream media. I know that. That's where they get all their information. You're going to soon find out that that's the wrong place to go for knowledge and wisdom. But if it makes you mad, that's sometimes a good thing. When my oldest son, who passed two years ago this past February, when he hit me with the two booms in my life that I didn't want any part of and didn't want to hear it, I got mad. But I found out something. I got the same riches to get glad in that I got mad in. And it ain't that hard to make adjustments when you know you're moving from deceit to truth. Amen. Most Christians in the church have got God in this place where they call on him when something bad is going wrong in their life. And, and when they're in extreme trouble, then that's where the what? The begging begins. Oh, Lord, please, how could you let this be? All of those things that the uninformed believer says. And, you know, Paul said... If a man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Where do you think he got that from? That's the same way God treats. We, we can, if we're ignorant of his solutions to our problems, the problems are going to still be there. We have to be diligent. We have to be the ones that studies and believe the things that Jesus said. Jesus told us how to face every problem we will ever meet, and not only face it, but come out on the other side looking good. Amen. Amen. I am trying my best. We're going to have our feet shod with the preparation of the good news of shalom in the Old Testament. The good news of all of us, everything we need for whatever problems life brings at our fingertips. That's what we're to have our feet. And I'm trying my best to get these shoes on you. But the problem I have, I only have a few minutes every Sunday to sow these seeds. And it's up to you what you feed yourself with the, the, the rest of the time. Your belief system is going to come by what you give the most heed to, what you listen to the most. And there's nothing I can do. I, I talked to Tammy Ryan if she's here today after the service. And she just touched me when she's told me that every morning when she gets up while she's getting ready for work, she listens to the previous Sunday's message every morning and talks about how good it does her and how it builds up her faith and she's ready to face whatever the day presents. That works. 
you've got time. You've got time to drive to work. Some, some of you have to drive 45 minutes an hour to work. You've got that time where you can be growing spiritually. And you can cut out some of the entertainment, some of the just thing where you just lay back and let it just, you can, on purpose, go and, and pay attention to what God would have you to listen to. And I'm telling you, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Charles Capps, I, I mention him a lot, and y'all to write his name down and just go look him up. He died about 10 years ago. He was an Arkansas farmer who understood all the agriculture things that Jesus was talking about. And he saw how well they jived with what he knew about agriculture. And he taught it to the day he died all over the world. He's one of the most, one of the best teachers about he's the one that came up with um, on the first page of the Bible the law of Genesis and that is everything produces after its kind everything produces after its kind words produce actions produce after its kind finances produce after their kind everything produces after its kind so often God is used in our life to justify our desire for vengeance or punishment inflicted on people that we have a problem with. Uh, we're going to talk about dropping that problem in just a little bit. Somebody that I listen to in the alter alternative um, media, and he has a huge following. And for the last three to four years, he has calmed me down when I begin to get off in fear and begin to get worried about this thing. He has always been able to calm me down. He can announce that he would be going live tonight, and he would honestly have like 30 million people listening to him tonight. And I really like him. And he's a new believer. And he's sort of the infiltration is trying to happen with him. But I believe with these new believers, God, he's going to have his way with them. Yeah. But just listening to him just a few nights ago, a couple of nights ago, he was talking about how he had a desire to see some of these evil pe people be hanged. And he really wanted to see that happen because of the, the millions of people they've caused to die in the last three or four years. And he said he was getting a lot of flack from some of his his. his listeners about that. And he said, well, you need to, what his answer was, you need to look at God in the Old Testament. He killed a lot of people. But see, that's what we do. That's when we have recreated God in our image and we desire vengeance. We desire punishment on people. That's Jesus said, remember, no one has seen God at any time, but here's Jesus to tell us about the Father, right? No man has seen God. When Moses said he saw him, at least the hinder parts of him. Other people in the Old Testament saw him. But a lot of the things, remember Jesus said, the law was given by Moses, but grace came by Jesus Christ. And on that, the law was given by Moses. Jesus would say, would, would, would bring up one of some of the Mosaic law. It is written, or you've heard it said. He said, but I say unto you, the exact opposite is what you're supposed to be doing. So that's what we've got to do. I quoted Archbishop Lazar who, um, from the um, Eastern Orthodox Church, and he said, any scripture that claims to reveal God must bow to the living Word of God when He came in the flesh. Jesus is the Word of God. And when you have the Word of God as your secret code ring to understand the rest of the Bible, then you can rightly divide the Word of truth. And then you're not upset about these things in the Bible that don't sound like God. They don't sound like God because they're not God. Amen. They're not God. It's all in the Mosaic Laws. Is it not about our, we're supposed to be doing animal sacrifice? Well, in Jeremiah, God, the same God that supposedly said this in, in, the, in the, the, the first five books, the same God in Jeremiah, Prophet Jeremiah is saying, I never said to your fathers about, about sacrificing animals. You know? So you have, he's looking through the eyes of Jesus, which Jesus wasn't here, but the Spirit of Christ was all through the Old Testament. Amen. And you can find the truth out there. Amen. Y'all getting anything this morning? Yeah. Besides using an aspect of God that, uh, when we desire 
punishment on someone, God is used to justify our reasons for playing the us and them game, the we're right and you're wrong. Um, God is for us. He ain't quite as for you as he is for, he might be for you, but he's more for us. And that's why we have so many different groups. Everybody thinks they've got the correct slant on it. And as I've told you the last two weeks, get a hold of this. God plays along with all of us. He plays along. He goes along with it. And people grow in all of those different belief systems. We've all done these things. And as we even grow in the things of God, I think we're going to, to some degree, still Hopefully, we'll get better, but we're still going to be doing these foolish things in our lives. And if, if you're seeing yourself doing those things, that's a good thing. You know, the, the first map of, the first rule of map reading is you got to know where you are before you can get anywhere else. If you just got to, uh, you got to have two points on the map. And that's, that's how it is. You've got to discover where you are if you want to get somewhere else. Dissatisfaction with your life and dissatisfaction with the things that you're doing through your religious beliefs will cause you to be willing to change even sacred cows that you have in your belief system. And it, it, when they start falling, they start falling. It's like what, what Ashley said in that thing I read. Now he has to question everything, found out nothing was the way he thought it was. And that's just about the way it is. But Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you can write that across, the, across your heart as truth because it, it is truth. When you cry out from your heart, God, if you're real, I've got to know the real you. I've heard all these things. I've done all this studying. I'm right now at LCCI. I don't know. I'm looking at it like a dog with a new dish. I'm not sure whether to bite or not. Ask God. God revealed it to me. I want to know you. We have scriptures of certainty. It says if you do that, God will tell you. He will answer you. Amen. And when he answers you, you'll know it's God if it lines up with something Jesus has said. And it won't be deception. Amen. Amen. When I cried out to God, I didn't know any religious formula for talking to God. And I really can't find one. Um, but the mess. How many of y'all knew me? When I don't think a lot of you do, when I was in my 20s, which was the end, ending of my mess. Who, who are these people? I can't see who you are. Oh, yeah. I do. <laughs> Robbie lived next to me, and we lived in a $75 a month duplex. And Robbie and, and um, his, his roommates, they'd, they'd cut off my electricity every month. And I'd have the window raised, just cussing them with every cuss word I knew. And they'd be over there in their duplex just laughing at me with their air conditioner on and their lights on. <laughs> but the mess that I got myself in by, make, by the choices I made, I could have gotten myself in the same mess had I been in Ethiopia, had I been in New Delhi, had I been in England, had I been in Brazil. It wouldn't matter where I would have been, I could have got in the same mess. And I would have that naive orientation going on that I'd gotten from my parents, from whatever religion they adhere to. But the heart cry is what God hears. Amen. I cried out from the depth of my being. This is it. My, my determination was I will sew my lips up if, I, if that's what it takes for me to stop taking stuff and drinking stuff. If that's what you need me to do, I will do it, Lord. I've got to know you, and I can't do this myself. From my heart, I was crying that out, and two weeks showed up, and everything changed. But like I say, I could have gotten myself in that same mess no matter where I live. 
And that's where I take such comfort in this thing I have read that is a quote from Billy Graham. You can go on YouTube and look it up yourself. It's him on camera saying these things. It was a telephone interview with, with Dr. Robert Shula in California. And this was before the internet. Robert Shula believed this way. Billy Graham believed this way, but he did not talk this way in his campaigns, in his meetings, or when he talked in churches. He didn't say these things. He's a little smarter than me. He knew what to say and what not to say. But on this conversation he was having with Dr. Shuler, he had no idea that it was going to go viral and be all over the internet, and the Christian church were going to be pulling away from Billy Graham, probably the most famous Christian to live in the 20th century, probably the most admired man of the 20th century. But now the church has taken after him because of this, one, this statement he made. But this is showing, it, when you look it up, look up Billy Graham denying Jesus, and it is there's no more him denying Jesus than I am. What he's doing is amplifying Jesus. He's bigger than the box we have put him in and kept him in. But he said, whether they come from the Muslim world, the Buddhist world, or the Christian world, or the non-believing world, they are members of the body of Christ. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but they know in their hearts they need something. It's all about the heart, always has been, always will be. It's not about getting your name on a roll somewhere so you can say you're a member of this church and learning a bunch of traditional things that ain't going to get you. Ain't can't, you can't fix a flat tire with it. But when you go to God, you won't have no flat tires. Amen? Amen? They may not even know the name of Jesus, but they know in their hearts they need something that they don't have. That was me. And they turn to the only light that they have. And I think they are saved and that they're going to be with us in heaven. That is heavy duty. Yes. Yes, um. And y'all might get, I might have read this 40 or 50 times. I'm going to continue to. It's an important point for Christians to grasp hold to. So many pastors that are behind the pulpit right now in this awakening that we're in know these things that we talk about. I mean, they had many a boom go in their thoughts about God from the Spirit of God Himself, and they have completely changed their thought. But instead of teaching them, what they do is they avoid talking about those areas of our relationship with God. And they do that because they know if they do, they will lose their papers and lose their job. Thank God, I, I, I ain't nobody got my papers. You know, I, I can do what I believe God would have me to do. And I feel so much compassion and, and, and sympathy for those preachers who know these things but can only talk in hushed tones about them to maybe they have a dear friend they can talk to about or maybe there's, there are a few other pastors they can talk about it. But like the hand has been taken off my mouth and other people that I'm seeing, it's, going to, it's what's going to be happening during this awakening that we're going through. Amen. I'm going to be talking about this in the, the funeral today. Why, why are we here? What's the purpose of our, of our car, in, incarnate incarnation? What do you say? It? Us being here in the flesh. I believe we're to be all we can be in our humanity. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But I believe ultimately it is to leave the world a little better then you found it. It's to cause things in other people's lives and your family's life to be at a higher level of order and godliness than it was when you showed up. I believe that we do that by rising up and being all that we can be in our humanity, in our, in our flesh, led by the Spirit of God and empowered by what I was talking about last week, the faith of God. Why? In order to prove to the world and dear goodness to prove to other believers that we can overcome adversity. And like Paul said, we can we are instructed and we can learn to be content no matter if things are going good or if things are going bad. 
You know, the book of Philippians, which is probably the most joyful letter that, that Paul wrote, he was in jail at the time. He was not in a good, but it's, he talks about joy more in it than, than ever. People couldn't understand me laughing at my son's funeral and having fun talking to the people. You can own purpose in the midst of grief and tragedy. You can flip the switch and enjoy the time and enjoy the company. The joy is something that we instigate and we cause to happen in our lives. And the reason we're told to rejoice, and Paul says, again, I say unto you, rejoice, is because the joy of the Lord is where we get our strength Amen. and our hope. Yes. You know, is that making sense? Yes. Then we find out if you're still asking, seeking, and knocking, and you, 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 you grasp hold that the most important thoughts in this Bible is when Jesus said, everything you're trying to figure out in here is wrapped up in do unto others that which you want them to do unto you. And what we're finding out is that the key is unselfish living, and it's hard for us to adjust to that. It's hard for me to adjust to that. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And that's been a serious adjustment that I deal with on a daily basis about the things of God. I found out when I am studying these things, when I'm talking to God, when I'm praying, when I'm looking up stuff, when I'm on the Internet doing research about different beliefs and everything, that's when I am as happy as I am right this minute. And there's no time in my week that I'm more happy than when I'm right here doing this because it's the same process. It's the same. And you sh you're a part of that process right now. Jesus said so in Mark chapter 4. The sower sows the, the seed. And you are the one, you're the soul. The soul of your heart is where it's going to. Amen. But I believe that's what we see in the life of Jesus because we are of the same design. He, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we fail to understand that our humanity is already one with God. We think of it as being separate. It's not. It's already one with God. I, I believe we have to grow into living a life of benevolence. But I also understand that's where you're going to find your satisfaction and your joy and your peace and your happiness. But we always need to realize the godlike nature of our humanity that is tucked inside us. The Luciferian system that we live in has pushed it way down in us where it doesn't just pop out. We have to draw it out. But still it's in there in all of God's children. How do I know that? How do I know that? How do I know that all, everybody in our realm has that part of God? And I'm talking about people now. I'm not talking about fallen angels that may be looking like people or any of those kind of things. Which, by the way, more and more people are talking about that now. That just thrills me when I hear people talking about stuff we were talking about six months or a year ago. But people that are people are the luckiest people Every one of us will drive up on a car that's flipped over and on fire, and without thinking twice, we will risk our life to save somebody we don't know. We don't know what color they are. We don't know what religion they are. We don't know what their beliefs are. We don't know what their sexual preference is. We know nothing about them, but suddenly something flipped in us, and we are willing to climb through a window in a burning house to save somebody we don't know. That's God in us. That proves that God is in every one of us. Me and my daddy were fishing, and my brother were fishing years and years ago before the mall was here out on Mr. Story's farm. And it was an old plant, plant, a pond in a cow pasture. And on Dawson Road, we heard a crash. We heard an explosion. And we got out of the boat and went just as fast as we could. And five people died in that car wreck that day. But we, we got there. It was too late. But we could hear the screams as we were getting there. We were all, that was, we were going to do something. And everything, all of our pettiness flies out the window when those kind of things crop up. And don't you know that's what happens in third world countries when bombing is going on? All of that stuff suddenly 
you're united with your neighbors like never before and you're looking out for each other. You know? Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 12, verily, verily, he said verily, two times in a row. That means he's serious about this. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the works that I do, you shall do also, and greater works shall you do, for I go to the Father. Now, why is that going to be greater works? Because he went to the Father, and the Spirit of God came to us. Not, not only just to be on us, but to be in us. The Spirit of God was all through the Old Testament, but after Jesus, the resurrection, the Spirit of God dwells inside us. We are the temple of the Spirit of God. But it says, the work, Jesus said, the works I do, you shall do also. And greater works shall you do, for I go to the Father. Wow. Now, how are you going to explain that away? I have heard it explained away now for 40 some odd years. And I've heard it ignored. Mostly that's how it's explained away. And I, and I know some I had a friend, he's deceased now, and I think his family's deceased too, I can tell this. He came to church, and he came as an empty vessel, seeking, asking, and wanting all of God that he could get. And he, just like that, his life turned around like ours did. But he saw this scripture, and he went to Phoebe Putney, and he went in there, got a visitor's pass, and started going room to room, expecting to be able to empty the hospital. He really did. He got kicked out. He did that several times. You do those kind of things when the Lord directs you to. Amen. But, I mean, the greater works we're doing right this minute, right this minute, you know a greater work that we're doing now that Jesus couldn't do or didn't do? People all over the world can be watching us live. Right now. Yeah. Amen. Amen. But before you give that a shot and go try to empty out the hospital, <laughs> get to where you're seeing it in your own life, that you're seeing fruit from God happening in your own life. This is our human nature. Instead of us forcing our life to line up with what Jesus said, we on purpose try to make what Jesus said line up with what we're already doing, you know. That ain't how it works. The word repentance means to change your mind, metanoia, change your mind. Jesus, Jesus showed us in his scriptures in red and the words he said, he showed us how we are wired. He showed us over and over the importance of his faith and his love operating in our life. And he showed us precisely how it works. The church has completely left it. Why? Because the church was infiltrated. Those things became metaphorical. They became um, just examples that we don't really like to teach because you can't explain them away. But God said, whosoever shall, Jesus said, whosoever shall say to the mountain, be thou removed. He said those things. And when you begin to look at your life, he said so much about the power of our tongue. When you look at your life, you will see everything that ever manifested in this life, you spoke forth hundreds of times probably. It's not when you say, mountain be thou removed, it's going to do it like that. But it's a process. You begin the process by sowing those seeds. And the ministry of angels is somehow involved in that. Amen. 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 Mm. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The substance. Substance is stuff that stuff's made of. Hope is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. In other words, that faith, your belief, remember when Jesus said, pray, I'm going to look at the scripture in a minute. When you, pray, when you pray, believe you receive, and you shall have whatsoever you sayeth. When you pray, believe you receive, that's now faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things, the evidence that you have them is you believed it when you prayed it. 
It's the title deed. I heard it explained like this one time. It's like the title deed to the promise is your faith and your belief. I bought some property next to me back when we lived on the river. It used to be a pe pecan orchard years ago back in the 20s, and it was sold off through the mail um, one year when pe pecans were doing real good. And I found the, the, the people that owned it, the property right behind where I own, and they were in North Carolina, and they had never seen the property, but they knew they owned it because they had the title deed. And that title deed was stand up in court. It was the evidence. That's how the promise of God, with his stripes we were healed. We pray for our healing. We believe we receive when we pray that we are healed, even though we don't feel like it, because we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't feel like it, but we declare we are made whole. With his stripes we were healed. That's our title deed until the healing shows up. And it's not denying that what's going on. It's just keep your mouth shut about it. The more you talk about how sick you are, the sicker you're going to get. Or how broke you are, the broker you're going to get, whatever it is that's in that salvation package. Healing, prosperity, safety, protection, preservation, all the, and the, the, the angels sent forth to minister to cause these things to come to pass in our life. And how do you get faith? Faith cometh by hearing. I don't know where God stores it, but I know wherever faith is taught, wherever belief in the things Jesus said is taught, faith jumps up and comes running. Yes, 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 yes. And then it's up to you to protect it, nourish it, and feed it. Right. I can't do that for you. Only you can do that. Right. Uh, that's my introduction. When Jesus told us about our prayer life, about things materializing in our lives, and in Mark 11, he was talking about prayer. When you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against any. Causing positive changes in our circumstances, no matter how bad they are at the moment. But when he talked about these things, he sounded like it was a done deal. Mm -hmm. That's the way I approach it. It's already done. It's done. Jesus has done all it took. All we have to do is believe we receive when we pray, stand on it, and talk in line with it until it shows up in our life. Remember James, Jesus' half-brother, said to ask in faith, nothing wavering. He said a double-minded man, one that doubts, D-O-U-B, T doubt, D-O-U-B-L-E, double. A, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not this man think he will receive anything of God. So you can't afford to be, well, you know, sometimes God does and sometimes he doesn't. No, your approach has to be God's already done it and I receive it now by faith, by his faith operating in me. Amen. Amen. Last week, we were in Mark 11, 24. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe, and you shall have them. Then Mark chapter 18, verse 19, Jesus again, Again I say unto you that the two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. If any of you shall agree, there is power in agreement. If you can't find somebody close to you to get in agreement about what you're believing for, call me up. I'll get in agreement. Susie and I get in agreement every day about something or another. Because we know there's power in agreement. When we get in power in this body, in agreement, I believe right now what's going on as, as, as my hand's coming off, people are awakening up and they're beginning to see the, 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 the wrong roads that have been gone down in Western Christianity. I believe our church is being built two at a time out there. And one Sunday we're going to walk in here and it's going to be a whole raft of folks, as Andy Griffith would say, in this room. And I'm looking forward to it. Amen. Jesus 14, verse 13. Now get this. This is one of my main points for the day. Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Amen. What have we taken that and run with? And I do it every time I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Look the Greek word, anoma. I think it's the Greek word that's translated name. 
And the main definition of name is not Jesus. It's not Billy. It's not Bob. It means character and the authority. If I pray for something, I have got to be operating in my life in the character of Jesus, which is operating in benevolence, understanding that I have the authority. The authority came from Jesus himself. Therefore, I say unto you whatsoever things you, you, you desire when you pray. And he just did it a minute ago when he said, the works I do, you're doing greater. That's the hand of the authority. In my name, you will cast out devils. You will speak with new tongues, Mark chapter 16 or 15, whatever it is. All of the those things. We believe it. We receive it. That's the way it is. It's not like that. It's like signing a check when you pray. In the name of Jesus, I pray. It's talking about the way you are in your life. If you're operating, as Paul said, as one of his ambassadors, a figurative representative of Jesus, as you have your day-to-day -day encounters with your fellow man. When you're doing that, you, it's in the bank. It's already in the bank. I don't know where the bank is, but God's got one. And it comes to you. It, it shows up. So, I've, I've, I've told you the story about Susie talking about wanting to be able to look out her bathroom window and see the river. And doggone, she said that happened twice in her life now. One of them was Flint River. Now we, it's on the Kinshapuni Creek, you know. Is that what we see, people operating in the character with the authority of, of Jesus and of God? Is that what we see in, the, in, in most people who call themselves followers of Jesus? We talked about that last week. The word, where we get the word mime that says be imitators, be a follower of Jesus. In, in the Beatitudes, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus said, blessed or empowered to succeed. Come on, the word, see the word blessed by the infiltrated church is just something we say, well, God bless you, brother. And somebody sneezes, God bless you. And, and you say, well, what does blessed mean? Well, it means blessed. What does that mean? Well, it means blessed. It means something. It is a supernatural empowerment to cause you to succeed at whatever it is you need to be blessed about. And Jesus said, you are empowered to, he said, blessed are or empowered are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Amen. Hallelujah. That's a, from a point of observation, they shall be called children of God. The very ones that I see who call themselves children of God's all the ones who are usually going around stirring up the mess and causing the problems, yeah. you know? Amen? Yeah. Why is it like that? Everything produces after its kind. Charles Capp said it, the law of reciprocity. Um, I was, in 1980, I was playing at it. No, I'm about out of time. I can't go there. The measure of faith is always working. It's either working for you or against you. Faith and fear is the same exact power that comes from the supernatural realm into us. Um, Job was so worried that his sons were God. All he thought about, his sons were going to go out and get drunk and naked and mess up their lives and die. And it's all he thought about. And every day he built an altar and would just pray, I know they're going to. And one day they died. And he said, the thing that I fear most has, has come upon me. That fear and faith is the same thing. James Griffin last Sunday said, your faith can either dig you a hole or it can make you whole. That's the truth. It's exactly what your belief and the choices you make and the beliefs that you hold are causing the things to come to pass in your life, good and bad. And you're blaming on the devil when a lot of times it's your mouth because you talk about, I can believe I'm going to get the whatever. Or I think I might be coming down with. And all of those things that there's no need to say, but it's those things that we have the hardest time to keep our mouth shut because we've been trained by the enemy to tell everybody what we're going through. I have my word cut out for me. I really do because I don't, I don't, we don't have a Wednesday night or Sunday night service anymore. It's up to you. I have to trust that you're going to, on purpose, 
Look up Charles Couch. So go listen to this week's message and last week's message. I would recommend listen to our message simply because this is the garden where God's put you. Amen. You, know, you didn't just sow up here and go, ah, let's go to that place I'll slap hell of our. Uh, let's see. I remember, do you remember me telling this? It was July 20th, almost six years ago, 2018, at 5 a.m. when I got a boom. I knew in Galatians chapter 5, chapter 6, that it says that, that, um, that faith works by love. I knew that. But something happened to me laying in bed. I knew that. And I knew that the slant of my preaching for the rest of my preaching days was going to be tilted toward love hooked up with the faith of God. I'm going to look at, at Galatians 1 through 6 real quickly. And the church at Galatia, they, as soon as Paul left them there alone, um, they got back under the law. And the truth is, if you're, going to, if you're going to rely on you keeping the law in order for you to be in right standing and good graces of God, then that's where you have to do it. You're not, grace is no longer there for you. You're now keeping rules, in order, rules and regulations in order to walk in concert with God. You understand that? Paul says in verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now, he wasn't talking about the Jewish people of the day that were, according to the tradition, on the eighth day circumcised. He was talking about the ones that suddenly in the church of Galatia that weren't, they were now because the Bible, the Old Testament says you must be circumcised, they were going to be circumcised because they thought that's what God would have them to do. I'm going to have a word with God about that one day. <laughs> says, Paul, I say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, he then is a debtor to do the whole law. If you're going to trust your relationship with God on you keeping the law, even the Ten Commandments. Look what the next verse says. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. That's frightening, isn't it? And how has the church used the term fallen from grace? A preacher gets caught with his pants down or whatever. It happens all the time. It seems like they're coming out of the woodwork lately. And they say on the nightly news, brother so-and-so has fallen from grace. No, darling, brother so-and-so fell into grace. Grace is there when you mess up. You don't fall from grace. Grace is always going to be there. But if you're trying to keep the law in order to maintain your relationship with God, you've got 716 of them or something that you've got to be seeing. I mean, you can't eat shrimp. You can't eat lobster. There's a lot of things you can't do. It don't make no sense. If you're under the law, you've got to kill your child when he talks back to you. Felt like it, but I never did it. <laughs> Verse 5, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. We just trust God that these things are so. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith, believing that worketh by love. I saw where, in fact, I saw yesterday the signing of the bill. The governor of Louisiana was signing a bill where he was requiring all um, schools and secondary schools to have in every room the Ten Commandments put on the wall. It might have been every school, but I think it was every room, had the Ten Commandments. And the Christians are just applauding that. I heard it brought up at, 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 a, at a presidential rally the other day, and the, and the people are just applauding that. That's how bad the church has been infiltrated. When you trust the, and of course we're not to kill, we're not to steal, we're not to covet our, our, man, our neighbor's wife, we're not to 
covet his, his ox or his donkey. Or nothing. That, we're not to do those things. But that is supposed to come from the Spirit of God that is on the inside of us. The Bible says those things are written on the tablets of our heart. Not keeping a rule. And well, no, the Bible says I can't do that. And when you say that, you are putting yourselves under the law and Christ is of none effect to you. And you're not going to see these things show up in your life. You, first of all, you have to know his love for us. Twice Paul brings up that all things that we do are lawful. All things are lawful. We cannot break the law because we're under grace. There's nothing you can do that is against God's law. All things are lawful. And he said not everything is expedient. You go, you go do dope all the time, you're going to get your life in trouble. You go rob a bank, you're going to spend some time in jail. I mean, but you, you, we know these things on the, on the tablets of the tables of our heart. We know how to live. We know the right and the wrong choices. I, I said years ago, every time somebody comes to me in my office for advice on their marriage or whatever, they already know. They just want me to get in agreement with their idea. Well, you know, the, I actually had this happen. The, 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 doesn't say anything about it. We can't have two wives at once. That happened, didn't it, baby? Common sense says you don't want to do that, though, wouldn't it? It boils down to you cannot treat people like crap and expect those promises of God to come to pass in your life. When you are doing to others the way you want them to do to you, that's when you begin to see the promises of God show up in your life. And that's why the stories about the ships being off the Russian ship, I, it doesn't bother me one bit. I know I'm okay. I know God's got me. I know I'm protected. Psalm 91 is my psalm. It's for me. Now, y'all can take it if you want it to, but it's mine. And I'm looked after. I, I, I'm only going to be a spectator as I see the ones that don't know no better get hurt. Amen? Amen? You can't talk about other people. You can't gossip about other people. That's not in the character of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen? Change your thinking about the name of Jesus, please. Look it up. Go get a concordance. You got one on your phone. You've got every translation of the Bible on your phone. You know that. It's just, it's just amazing where we live. But you can't be agreeing with any form of violence. And wanting, that's why I want somebody to be our commander in chief that stops wars and don't start them. Right. Amen. Amen. Love causes faith to materialize your prayers. The substance of things hoped for, they show up when you're operating in love. And it's now. Now faith is that substance. Amen. Faith operates by love. Forgiveness and love, dear people, are one and the same. You can't separate forgiveness and love. You must forgive if you have anything against anybody, Jesus said. And he said that's going to open up the flow between you and God. And your thoughts immediately, your thoughts went through this watching everywhere, just about everybody, but you don't know what they did to me. I don't ever watch Glenn Beck. I, we were going somewhere Saturday morning, and I was flipping around on, on, on SM, whatever it was, Sirius. Um, and I heard Glenn Beck say, forgiveness is the only way to get over it. That's true. When we hold something against somebody, it's like we're taking a poison, but we're, hope, we're hoping it hurts them. But it don't. It hurts you. Right. It's called dryness of the bones. There's scriptures about that. I was watching Pat Robertson praying for people to forgive people one day. This was back in 1982, I think. <clears throat> and they were just having a, it was like a revival. Something was supernatural going on. And people were turning loose of things that they had held against loved ones and just people at work or whatever. And they began to get testimony that day about people being healed of arthritis. Think about that. It's easy to turn loose of it. Pray. Pray for the person that you hold something against. And understand, every time you think about what you'd like to do to them, or like to see happen to them, see, I get it in and I turn it. 
uh, pray for them. And watch God turn it around, and you'll be set free. For 27 years, my first wife was in my pocket, and I would conveniently take her out and beat up on her. But when we faced it, when we began to pray about them, and they were praying about us, and we didn't know that, turned into being some of our, the best friends we've ever had. And all of that is gone. It's gone. All of that hatred, you know what I'm talking about. Forgiveness is all about you. Amen. Love wins. It's like she sang a minute ago. Your bright future can start right this minute, this day. If you will just listen to the things that I'm telling you, there are dark forces at work in the world, and they're rising up like never before. Isaiah 60, which I know, I mean, I'm not sure about my eschatology, but I'm sure about this one. We're in the days of Isaiah 60 where he says, darkness shall cover the earth and dense darkness or gross darkness the people. But there's going to be a group of people that the folks that are in the darkness are going to run to for help. That's going to be the church. But it ain't going to be the church the way it looks right this minute. But very swiftly, the church is going to change and going to suddenly be the church that Jesus died for. And we're going to see it come to pass in our lives. Amen. I'm out of time. Did y'all get anything out of this? I could go on. <clears throat>